Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, this is Station. I'm ready for the event. European Space Agency, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is the European Space Agency. How do you hear me? Hello, Josef. I read you loud and clear. How me? Hello, Matthias. Uh, very nice to see you and very nice to be with you. I'm today in Brussels uh, and I have the honor of being with the President of the European Commission, Mrs. Ursula von der Leyen. Mrs. Ursula von der Leyen will have a chat with uh, young people. And as you know, inspiring young people is extremely important because they are the talents of the future and we need their energy and their inspiration. So today I'm also uh, joined by a moderator, Gaspar, and uh, let me hand over to Gaspar for the moderation of this talk. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being with us today. I am here in Brussels with the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, and we are connected live with ESA astronaut Matthias Morer on the International Space Station. We have received many questions for Matthias on social media, but why don't we start with you, President von der Leyen? Thank you very much, Gaspar. And it's good to see you again. First, we've seen each other in Strasbourg and now in Brussels. And thank you also to Director General Josef Aschbacher and, of course, to the European Space Agency for this great opportunity. And last but not least, thank you, Matthias, for taking the time to chat with us. So, Matthias, do you hear us loud and clear? Guten Tag, Frau Präsidentin. Guten Tag, Josef Aschbacher. Bonjour, bon après-midi, Gaspar. And hello, everyone listening to us. Yes, I read you loud and clear. How me? That's very good. We hear you also loud and clear. We are impressed the many languages you're speaking, Matthias. Matthias, as you know, uh, the European Union's top priority is to become the first climate neutral continent by 2050. We want to protect our precious natural resources, our forests and our oceans. And this is why we have the European Green Deal. It's basically our roadmap to save the planet. But it's not always easy for us here on Earth to grasp how fast the planet is changing and therefore to convince everybody how fast we have to act. Climate change is a really urgent matter. So I was always wondering how that change is visible from space. And Matthias, what kind of changes can you actually see on your, on our planet uh, with your own eyes or maybe through telescope? Perhaps you might want to tell us about it. Yes, indeed, we from the International Space Station, we fly at a height of around 400 kilometers above our planet and 16 times a day we circle around our planet. And we can observe a lot of details. We can see slash and burn forest, we can see droughts, so lakes that uh, used to be on old maps, we cannot see anymore here. Glaciers that used to be much bigger on old maps or older astronauts tell us about, um, they are now smaller. And um, we can also see that human mining takes a, uh, puts a lot of scars into the surface of our planet. And um, so we can observe a lot of these floodings, for example, that I observed two or three weeks ago in Brazil, uh, or other events like the eruption of volcanoes. We see quite a lot of stuff from the space station and we can report about it. We are eyewitnesses of all this. But I believe the best data to observe our planet and to deliver also the, in, like the important data that politicians need to act um, comes from the European Cop uh, Copernicus Earth Observation Fleet. And these satellites produce a lot of data. They are actually the best uh, Earth observation satellite fleet that exists currently in space around our planet Earth. Europe is leading here. And this data has free data access policy and so it's very good for European economy and also for startups to use this data.
you seem uh, very committed to climate action, Matthias. Uh, was it always a cause close to your heart? Well, Gaspar, you know, it's like now I circle our planet in 90 minutes. And um, I actually did one round the world trip before becoming an astronaut. And uh, I had the chance to travel many, many countries of this planet. And I've been in India when there was flooding. I've been in Indonesia when there were landslides. So I've seen how like people suffer from very close up once nature hits and uh, like destroys the baseline of their life. I've been um, also on Pacific beautiful islands, but islands that are so close to the water and now with the rising sea level, like these paradises are threatened to disappear. And so it's like the entire life that people lived on this island uh, has no substance anymore. So I, I've seen quite a lot of places and I think uh, that changed my attitude and it made me really to become an ambassador for our planet Earth and to protect the climate and to reduce the uh, warming of our planet. Indeed, and uh, I hope many will hear your important message today. Uh, one last question from me before I give the floor to our audience. Uh, why is your mission called Cosmic Kiss? It's very intriguing to me. Yes, Cosmic Kiss is the name of my mission and basically it expresses a love that we have for space. Ever since people looked into the night sky, they uh, wondered what is out there and uh, how did life come to Earth and uh, how did the universe um, start up with and how was our solar system formed and is there another planet Earth where life is possible? So all these are very interesting questions and um, so the, my mission patch is inspired by a really old depiction of the night sky. It's a sky of Nebra. That uh, is a, a relic that was created 4,000 years ago. It was found like less than 20 years ago in Germany. And uh, I was inspired by this sky disc and thought like this is a very nice expression to uh, animate people and uh, to motivate people to be interested in space. And uh, yeah, I forgot to mention also before, it's like my patch for my mission but I think a really important patch is also the European patch against climate change. Thank you very much, Matthias. And now I will give the floor to our community. We have a first question from uh, Aisha. Hello, Matthias and everybody. My name is Aisha and I live in France. It is always fascinating to follow the adventure of the astronauts on board the ISS, but also the incredible work of the European Space Agency is doing to unravel the mysteries of the universe. I would like to know if there is a solution so that we can get rid of the space debris that threatens the ISS, and if so, how? Thank you. Over. Yes, this one's for you. Yes. Okay. For you. Okay. So it's like uh, the message came a little bit undistorted up here. It's space debris. That's what I understood. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. It's a very, so very important Matthias, topic. Uh, it is an, indeed space debris, and this is an issue. Please go ahead, Mrs. President. Matthias, this one is for you about the debris. Okay, I take this question. Um, actually, it's a very, very, very uh, up-to-date topic because even today, we have a collision warning for later on today with space debris. So um, currently, our planning teams on the ground are calculating if this uh, debris has actually um, like the potential to hit with us around nine, half past nine o'clock tonight. And if so, then we need to do a, a debris avoidance maneuver. So we need to accelerate the ISS and to avoid this debris. And this happened already two weeks ago when we had to avoid debris 
ended two weeks ago, it was even more challenging because we had to avoid one, but by avoiding one, we had the next debris upcoming. So the, the, the scientists and the technicians on the ground, they had to calculate a perfect acceleration of the ISS to dodge in between the two debris particles or parts. And um, that shows us that there is a lot of debris here in space. And it's a, it's a very important topic. Um, not only for the ISS because it puts us at risk, but also because of the, uh, all the satellites that we have. Um, imagine a life without satellites. I think you would be really surprised how life would change. It's like all the data that we get from our satellites, from weather to uh, like GPS or navigation systems like Galileo, Earth observation satellites like Copernicus. So I think modern society couldn't work um, without any satellite data. So we need to take action we need to um, like make sure that we avoid future uh, space debris and ESA has here a declaration and Josef Aschbacher uh, declared it very strongly um, we by 2030 want to have a net contribution to space debris which means like we need to take actions to take massive parts out of space uh, but also reduce the introduction of new space particles uh, another topic is also important that we get a space traffic management. Today we have air traffic management. When one plane within Europe flies from one country to the other or outside of Europe, we have clear rules um, and we have people that check these rules. For space, um, we don't have such clear and strong rules and the political action is required. And I think Europe should lead this and take a strong role into this one. Well, indeed, Matthias, this is uh, fascinating to listen to you because it's actually the, the fact that huge increase of number of satellites in space. And as you said, the greater the number of satellites, uh, the more the risk that has um, that is out there. So indeed, this is why in two weeks we will present at the European level a strategy for space traffic management, just as you described. So we will look at every topic. First, of course, as you said, the need for new common rules in space. And then uh, we have to ensure an efficient management of space traffic, as we have the air traffic or the road traffic rules. And most importantly, of course, we have to convince our partners in the world that we need to tackle this issue together. So as you see, space will keep us busy. Thank you, President. Now we have a question from Freya. Is it lonely in space? Or how is it up there? It's a very nice question. Indeed, there are not so many people in space, and space is huge. So um, you could think that we feel lonely here in space. Currently, there are only two space stations circling our planet Earth. One is the International Space Station, and we are currently seven astronauts here on board. But we always work together. Uh, we also spend uh, like a lot of time outside of work together. So we don't feel lonely, and we can call our families. There's also another space station flying around our planet is the Chinese space station and there are three uh, Chinese colleagues of us which I personally know from uh, from a joint training with them and um, I also don't think that they feel lonely. Thank you. Now we have a question from Kian. Hello. My name is Kian. I want to ask you a question. That question is, could you see satellite from a national space station? Well, we fly 400 kilometers above our planet Earth, and a lot of satellites fly much, much higher than us, and some of them fly around our level. And the satellites usually move very fast, and uh, so it's like I can see them in the same way that you can see them on the ground. Whenever the satellites have their solar panels, that's the way they get their energy from, when these solar panels are hit by the sun, and I get the sun reflection, then I can see them for a brief moment. So I see them very quickly moving on the horizon, but that's also when you look in the night sky and you see very quickly moving uh, small points, that's also a sun reflection from the satellite. So it's very similar.
That must be very impressive. Uh, now we have a question from Tala, and I'm sure all the young people watching us will enjoy this one. Hi, my name is Tala Aburazit, and my question for you is, what is the advice you would give for future aspiring astronauts? Well, if you want to be astronaut, then I would say, like, follow your heart, follow your dream. It's um, very easy to be an astronaut, I have to say, like being here in space. I can float and I can do whatever I like to do. It's like I, I love all the science work that we do and the technician work and the repair works that we do. Uh, the difficult part is to become an astronaut. And so a lot of people have the same dream. So you need to be good in school, you need to be good in university. And um, so it's very important that you are a good pupil, but especially that you do what you like and what you love to do. It's, uh, if you don't like your work that you do, then I think it's really, really difficult to come up here. Yeah, but the most important part is follow your dreams, follow your heart. Makes me want to become an astronaut myself. <laughs> Thank you, Matthias. Uh, our last question comes from Camille. Hi. I'm very glad to have a woman as president of the European Commission. But I'm wondering why don't we have more women astronauts? What can we do to get more women in space? Thank you. Again, a very good question. Actually, before we give the floor to Matthias, uh, President, do you want to say uh, anything about this? Well, indeed, we should definitely have more women in space and more women on Earth in science, technology and engineering. But the most important thing is for girls and women to understand that no job is out of reach. And as you've said, Matthias, um, live your dreams, go by your heart, believe in yourselves. And yes, of course, girls and women can go to space. This is my message. Matthias. And I couldn't say it any better than uh, Mrs. President. I can only agree with you. Um, indeed, it's like I have one colleague up here in space, Kayla Barron. She's a NASA astronaut, and she is like a wonderful astronaut, and she does a lot of the stuff like better than us guys. So it's like, um, yeah. So the girls should dare to be an astronaut. The girls should also dare to have lead positions. Very often, it's not that they cannot do it, but that they just believe they are not as good as the boys. And so, um, yeah, but I can reassure, um, I've seen many uh, female astronauts, and when I fly back in April, my European colleague, Samantha Cristoforetti from Italy, uh, will come up here and she will continue my work. And she's already been up here in space for like more than half a year, and she's just an outstanding astronaut. And on her spacecraft, there will be two female astronauts and two male astronauts. So it's like 50-50%, and I think that should be the future. A mixed team is always much better than a single male or a single woman team, I, w I would say. In the European astronaut selection that we have currently ongoing, um, we are entering round two of the selection process, and I'm very happy to hear that uh, Josef Aschbacher announced uh, a few days ago that 40% of the participants that entered now round two are female astronaut candidates. Thank you, Matthias. Unfortunately, we are, it's already time to say goodbye. Uh, thank you all for being with us today. And thank you, President van der Leyen and uh, Matthias Moreau uh, from ISS. Uh, it has been a true pleasure to host this unique interview with you. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did, President. Yes, thank you so much, Matthias, for making us travel with you to space. And thank you for reminding us how beautiful our planet is. We must do everything possible to protect it so that the next generation of men and women astronauts can enjoy the same sight as you do. And we wave goodbye. Thank you very much, uh, President von der Leyen. I actually like very much your, um, your Green Deal, and I felt the comparison with this is European moment for the man on the moon. I think that was an absolute appropriate comparison. Good luck with all that, and best regards from the International Space Station. Take care, all. 
uh, for helping us uh, doing the logistics of making this possible. Houston, thank you. And uh, once more, Gaspar has been a fantastic moderator. And once more, Ursula von der Leyen, it was such a pleasure. Thank you from my side and goodbye. Thank you also, Josef. Goodbye and all the best with your talks in Brussels. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. And thank you to all the participants from EQ and ESA Station. We are now resuming operational audio communications.